hello and welcome to Char Reads. Uh, I haven't posted on this channel in about a year and that is not because I've had COVID the whole time. <laughs> it's been a mere 15 weeks of this hellhole. Um, but you know, holidays, moving house, new jobs, etc. I just kept putting it off last year and that happens on this channel sometimes, we'll come back eventually. Uh, but I wanted to make this video today um, because I found it really comforting hearing other people's journeys with long COVID and thought it felt about the right time to share mine. I caught COVID on the 21st of January. Um, it was a Friday night and we had friends visiting that were in London. Uh, so we decided to get the train up and meet up with them for a drink. We went to a very, very busy bar. And as soon as I stepped in, I was like, God, I don't wanna be here. <laughs> this is very loud and there's a lot of people and there's a lot of COVID in the air. Um, but it was too late to like change where we were gonna go, so. I just went with it and uh, it hasn't worked out too well, to be honest. Um, on the Sunday night, I started getting like a tickly throat, which to me usually means that I've been, that I'm a bit run down, I've been working too much, so I just need to like go to bed and rest off. Um, on the Monday morning, I woke up, felt awful, message work to be like, I'm gonna spend the morning sleeping. Um, so I did that and then at Monday lunchtime, I took a COVID test, a lateral flow test, and it was negative. Um, so I was like, okay, this is just a cold. <laughs> um, I just need to like power through and it'll work itself out. Uh, so I kept working, um, that whole week I fe felt sort of worse and worse. Although sort of by the end of the week, the, um, my, th my throat had really hurt, <laughs> but my throat was and the kind of like coldy symptoms had phased out towards the end of the week. And then Friday I was meant to be going, um, to London that night for book club with a couple of friends. And I felt really bad. <laughs> I felt really bad, but I so wanted to go see them because I hadn't seen them in like ages. Um, so I was resolved to go, even though I felt awful. And then at lunchtime, I took a COVID test because we do that every time we meet up with people and it was positive. And I was shocked. <laughs> I was so shocked because I was like, wouldn't it have been positive then? I just assumed that I was on a cold that wasn't progressing. And I hadn't really looked at the Omicron symptoms at the time because I had I didn't have a cough, I didn't um, hadn't lost my taste of smell or taste of you know what I mean, and I wasn't checking my temperature, but I just sort of like assumed it wasn't COVID because I'd had a negative test. And then once I got the positive test, I was like, okay, <laughs> I see what's been going on here, uh, and here we are, fourteen weeks later. I wanted to make this video partly because as what I said before, like it's really useful for me hearing stories of other people that are going through this thing. Uh, but partly also because I listened to this audiobook this week um, called When the Body Says No by Gabor Mate. It's about the link between stress and illness and it is terrifying, it is terrifying. It talks about so many illnesses, cancers, ALS, MS, uh, IBD, and how they can like really be traced back to personal circumstances, specifically emotional suppression, um, poor boundary setting, like putting people above you always, um, and the suppression of anger. Um, and it also talks a lot about how your approach to sickness can like affect how it progresses. This book really shook me, um, but I looked at some of the reviews for it. I'm gonna slowly slump back in my chair towards the end of this, but maybe I should just lean into that now. Um, some of the reviews mentioned that it was kind of blaming the patient for being sick, um, which is difficult because, you know, like my, my stepmom died of cancer, my mum's had cancer, everyone knows people <laughs> who, who have been really ill and, and have died, um, and I don't want it to be, like, I don't, I'm not saying that that's their fault that they got sick or they weren't able to overcome it or whatever. I think there's a real hole in our language when it comes to um, words like blame, fault, even like sorry, that don't ascribe like a moralistic, sort of like a aggressiveness to it. Like something can be causal without it being like, you know, you're a pile of shit because, you know, your parents didn't treat you well and that's why you got cancer. <laughs> this book was really intense in its message about the, the link between stress and illness and while I don't want to ascribe blame, I don't want to blame myself for being sick. Um, I do want to analyze the, the circumstances and figure out like what, what led me to being sick 
and how sick I got and how long I've been sick and try and figure out the best way for me to approach the rest of this recovery process. So we're thinking holistic and um, strapping because this is going to be a long one. Let's go back to 2004 when I was 11 years old. Um, I moved schools and I really, really didn't like my new school. I was very, very unhappy there. And about once a week or once every two weeks, I would lie and say I was sick so I could stay home from school. I knew exactly how to like heat the little thermometer with the bedside lamp <laughs> to get it like right up to 38 degrees and be like, mom, I'm too sick to go to school. Um, and then the, the, the next year I moved schools, I was much happier, but um, it took a while for that kind of coping mechanism to fade. Coupling that with late teenagehood for me, um, I did a lot of confusing self-flagellation with discipline. So I'd be very, very harsh on myself. I'd be harsh on the way I looked, what I ate, um, my academic performance, and that extended to like my feelings about sickness. Whenever I felt sick, I would be mad at myself for like letting myself feel that way and not be able to, being able to overcome it. But also when I gave in and would like take time off from being sick, I would be like, well, you're just making this up so you can have time off. Like, do you really, are you really that sick? Um, so I really lost that, that connection between my mind and my body and I had no trust there at all and that really has extended throughout my adulthood and it's something I'm only really coming to grapple with now. I think now it's much more on the side of like being sick but then berating myself for being sick rather than like feeling guilty about not being sick enough if that makes sense. And also because until last year, um, for the previous few years at least, I worked as a contractor. So I would get paid by the day. And if I was sick, I obviously wouldn't get paid that day. I didn't have that slack built into my finances to actually take time off when I was sick. So what I would do is I'd shift my days around or I would try and work through sickness in the daytime and be like, oh, why, why, do you, why do you feel bad? Like, why are you letting yourself feel bad? And then in the evenings, I would like cancel social plans to recover. And then I'd be like, well, you're obviously not sick enough to cancel that dinner because you went to work. So you're just a terrible friend. And it's just this really toxic cycle of self-hate that I'm just trying to unpick now. <laughs> so let's fast forward to November, 2011. I had reached this point in my career where I... Um, I didn't feel like I could like advance much further by being a contractor. So I decided it was time to get my first full-time job, um, which is very fortuitous as you all come to see. Uh, but yeah, I started this job in mid-November, but I had a really bad start for a variety of reasons. Um, I was working in technology I really wasn't familiar with, like was given a lot of like responsibility and ownership over something I had no idea how it worked. Uh, my manager got promoted the day I joined, so I didn't get to talk to her at all. My onboarding was uh, delayed because it was Thanksgiving. Um, my work laptop broke almost immediately. Um, I had these migraines <laughs> like three weeks into work. I got, I had these two really bad migraines and um, I was like, why am I getting migraines? I'm not stressed at all. And now I'm like, Charlotte, you were very stressed. <laughs> you were very stressed. Oh, um, and then it was Christmas and then just before we came back to work in January, my kind of direct boss, who I was leaning on quite a lot, his house burnt down. Um, so he like understandably wasn't in work at all. So I was still really lost. I just hadn't found my feet in this new job at all. Um, and coupled with that, I was working on this personal project um, that I was working really intensely from sort of like mid-December until I got sick. Um, and it felt very urgent for me to work on. And it's one of those things where you're like, I'll be done then. And then you get to then you're like, oh, no, there's so much more to do. Um, and because I was like partnering with a platform to um, release that, I just felt like I really needed to get it done. So I was working extremely hard. I think the week before I got sick, I clocked up more than 40 hours of work outside of work, working on that side project. So I was working two full full time jobs basically um and i i, I usually th i kind of thrive off that pressure like i really like doing i like intense work um and the reason that felt sustainable for me is that it wasn't it didn't need to be sustained it, it was another couple of weeks um but yeah the time uh, when i got sick i was 
under a lot of pressure <laughs> and it didn't really feel that way but like clearly as I say that out to you you're like wow yeah of course that girl was gonna get sick and get sick really badly and then when I did get sick because I didn't realize it was COVID I kept working through it um I guess I hadn't really seen many models of people at work yet who had been sick um like I'd seen people be be like oh I'm gonna take the afternoon off because I'm not feeling very well or oh, I'm gonna miss these meetings today because I need to lay low so I kind of thought that that was the done thing like you didn't really take time off um unless it was like scrappy little bits you're kind of always on um I know that's that is not what they were trying to portray to me whatsoever uh but that's the sort of environment because I really felt like I was on the back foot from all of these other work things I really wanted to be on it all the time in work um, so I kept working through that week and then even when I found out I had COVID because I was sort of like oh I definitely feel better than I did a couple of days ago um, I just kept working <laughs> it wasn't until uh, the I think the Wednesday of the following week that um, I rang my doctor because I was like look I've had COVID for a week and a half I'm still feeling awful like can you set me up with some sort of recovery plan um, and she was like it's been a week and a half like these things take time and she literally said it sounds like you need me to give you permission to rest <laughs> and I was like yes yes that that is what I need um so she was like don't you're not allowed to work for the next week like fully clock off don't work for next week and if you want to we can check and learn um but like rest is the only way to get through this. And I said this at work and I clocked off and um, I had like one colleague who was particularly helpful who had long COVID in 2020 um, talked to me about building in more slack into life and more resilience and making sure that life can still go on without you, like in your household and stuff. Needing that rest has been a very long journey for me. It's the kind of thing where every week I was like, wow, a week ago I was so bad at resting, but now I'm great. I'm resting all the time. And then like two weeks later, I'd be like, no, you're still trying to hustle then. Like you're still expecting yourself to get well immediately. So although I wasn't working and I was lying on the sofa all day, um, I still felt like, oh, I guess I'm, I'm getting better. So next week I can go back to work. And I'd say to the work people like, oh, I should be well enough to start then. And then that, that week I'd be like, mm, nah, maybe the next week. And because um, COVID has this, this really annoying roller coaster where you can feel good, you can feel good for like a couple of days. You can be like, wow, maybe I'm over it. I'm good. I can go back to work. I can resume my life. I can resume my social plans. And then like hits you like a brick again. And it does this so often. And in the start, I felt like it was somewhat related to the amount I was exerting myself. Um, I did think like, okay, no, I did try and do something that day. I did go on a walk that day and then I felt bad a couple of days after. So like, fair enough, I need to modulate myself. But then after like a month, I would say that my crashes were completely random, completely random. So there was nothing, it felt very hopeless because there wasn't anything I could do to predict or alleviate these like huge crashes. Something I did start doing I think about six weeks in um, is that I started a symptom journal and I also backfilled it from the start of my sickness with what I could remember. And that was really, really helpful because then I, could, I couldn't lie to myself as easily because I could say, I've been feeling great the last couple of day, days. I think I'm good. Maybe I'm good to work again, maybe the following week. And then I look back at my symptom journal and it would say, you know, you felt good for three hours on that one day. <laughs> so um, that was... Uh, that was an interesting journey of the what I thought and the reality that I was presented and that I recorded. I would highly recommend keeping a symptom journal uh, for anyone going through something like this. It's invaluable. It's also so useful to track your symptoms over time. Um, and, you know, doctors and stuff, theoretically, one day might be interested in it. Sorry, dog's having a little scratch of his bed. He can come join in a bit. Um, I actually did go back to work for a while. Uh, I think about eight weeks in, I was like, okay, I'm well enough, but because I'm really good at resting now, I'm going to follow my doctor's advice and do a phased return. So I'm just going to work for the mornings 
until I feel well enough to go back to full time. I was like, I feel confident that I can sit at a desk for a couple of hours a day. That was my barometer for whether I was well enough to work. Can I sit at a desk? Can I can I stop my body from telling my telling me that I need to lie down for a couple of hours? That's good enough for work. Um, so I did that, and I think I lasted three days before I had another crash where I was like, I can't work in the morning. And I think it was probably about four weeks of me being like, I work in the mornings and then often failing to work in the mornings. So now I've reached an interesting point in this journey where I've done the last five weeks or something of being nominally part-time and working in the mornings, but I haven't worked for the past two weeks. And I found the time that I was working was really unproductive because I had to spend so much time just getting caught up with stuff. Um, it would be really annoying because I cancel meetings last minute with people because I'm working mornings and I'm in a remote company where like a lot of people are in the US, I wouldn't get to talk to them at all. So the feedback loop would be really slow. So working part-time doesn't work. I am, no, I'm not physically capable now. I'm still, at, I'm still in that, in that lovely cycle of like figuring out what rest means. I know I'm not even fully there, <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting close. So I know that I cannot work to the best of my abilities, full stop at the moment, I can't. And I have reached this threshold at work where I got 12 weeks of paid sick leave, which is incredible. And I'll talk more about work and, and money in a sec. Um, but I now have to transition towards a different um, income thing, which means I'm not allowed, I basically can't come back part-time. And I'm now leaning in to just being sick until I really, really feel I could come back full-time and be absolutely fine. Because I don't have a choice after that. If I come back, I have to come back. Otherwise, they may be able to fire me. Hold up. <laughs> because now, if I come back to work, I'm not allowed to be sick again because it would mess with this whole insurance thing. So I'm at this place now where I'm like, I am not going to work for a considerable period of time. I'm no longer like, I will be well next week. It's just not worth it because I know that this comes in cycles and it's shit, but there's something comforting in being like, don't even, don't even like log those high days as being like, maybe an indication that I should work. <laughs> I'm sure there are those of you watching this being like, you are a workaholic and you need to check out. You need to just, and I'm on the journey, I promise you. But man, it's a tough old journey. So now I'm not working. I don't see myself working in the near future. And if I have, I'm going to say I want a solid full week of feeling fully able to work before I come back to work. Um, because it's just not worth it for anyone otherwise. All right, so let's move on to the sexy part of the video where I talk about all of my symptoms and how shit I've been feeling. So as most people with COVID, even normal COVID will experience, fatigue and breathlessness is just the pits. I think the first six weeks, I didn't take the dog out. I had all my meals prepared for me. I did have like a couple of daring excursions where I had like a 30th birthday party and my dad's surprise birthday party that I really wanted to go to. And I really pushed it in those times and I felt shit for a couple days after. Um, so if I really forced myself, I could walk around. Uh, but it was, uh, rare it was rare to be able to move that much i would get breathless from walking across the room and it was this deep malaise this deep fatigue that just it felt like every single cell in my body if i concentrated on like a little spot on my arm i could feel that the cells in that arm felt twice the weight that they had been before i felt like i was just being dragged down and needed to lie flat horizontal all of the time my legs ached so much. My legs still ache. That is still a like permanent feeling I have of my legs weigh so much more and they're slightly kind of tingly and it's sort of the same feeling as after you've gone on a really good run or like the morning after you've exercised well and you're like, I'm just kind of like, I'm more aware of my muscles. Like they, they feel like they've been working. It's like that feeling, but without any of the gratification <laughs> and it's permanent and it's awful. The fatigue was the main thing that got me down in the first couple weeks, just absolute inability to move. 
I spent a lot of time watching TV. I watched all of Riverdale. I watched all of Veronica Mars. Um, because, yeah, that's all I could do. It's just sort of kind of stare vacantly. I couldn't really engage with anything. It's funny how the symptoms just kind of like morph into other things. So around the six week mark when I was more up, I could take the dog for a walk in the park if I needed to um, slowly with lots of breaks along the way. Um, but I could, I could do that. Uh, I started having these periods of paralysis, um, which was terrifying. Like I came back from the park, I lay down on the sofa and then I just couldn't, I couldn't move my body and I had, to, I couldn't move even anything but my eyes. Um, and I had to s slowly make sounds with my closed mouth to alert my boyfriend to come and help me sit up and I was crying and it was really, really scary. Um, and he had to like slowly move my arms until I kind of got my fingers, my feeling back in my fingers and stuff. Um, that was really awful. And I had a similar incident outside a pub. I felt really bold this one Sunday and we went out for a roast at a pub that's an eight minute walk from here. Um, and I, I felt good as we we're walking there and we sat down and halfway through the meal, I was like, I'm starting to feel really bad. Like I, I want to go. But I didn't want to like end this nice thing like for the first time when we were able to go out and get roast in ages. I didn't want to like be like, no, we need we must leave now. Um but by the time we did leave, I felt really bad. And we got outside of the pub and I was like, I can't walk home. I'm sorry, I can't walk home. Um so I sat down outside the pub while my boyfriend went home with the dog and um and got the car to come pick me up. But I was sitting outside this pub and I slowly just felt every limb in my body seize up and then I was just not sitting with my head against the wall my mouth open and just like sobbing because I couldn't I couldn't move a muscle and when he pulled up in the car I it took like everything I had to like lift my arm up and put it on the table and like pull my body away from this wall it was really really scary um and yeah I talked I talked to a doctor about that um and it was it was the first male doctor I've spoken to and he was like I think it's just anxiety and I was like how dare you how dare you it's like a really traumatic physical experience um and anyway over the over the following weeks I kind of I was like I don't think it was anxiety because it's definitely very very physical <laughs> um but I started to recognize when I got into that, that mental cycle of being like, oh fuck, what if I can't move my arm? And then I would just like move, I just like, I'd force my body to move my arm immediately. So I thankfully never got into that scenario again. Um, no, there are a few times I had completely dead arms and Brian needed to come and like shake them for me. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was one of the most scary, scary things that I experienced. What else happened? I developed a stutter, a pretty bad stutter when I'd have these phases of throughout the day, um, in like maybe like an hour a day where I would be like prostrate on the sofa, like feeling awful. Um, I wouldn't be able to sleep, speak and I would stutter my words. And I often just couldn't even find words. And you may have noticed through a video, I still stutter a bit now um, when I feel, and I've never stuttered in my life before. Uh, I, I still stutter when I'm struggling. I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, so that was, that was a, a one that I really, really didn't like. Um, the main, I guess the main thing that's been keeping me down for the last, well, for most of the time is the general malaise just being like my body wants me to lie down the whole time um I've also got headaches I've had sensitivity to light and sensitivity to sound the whole time um I, th I think there are a few things that are like going up and I think my sensitivity to sound is increasing uh, definitely my heart palpitations are getting worse we had tickets to a Rebecca Black gig today yes that Rebecca Black um and because I felt good yesterday, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it. And then this morning I woke up and I was like, I'm not gonna make it. But now I think about it, the the idea of the sound would just, oh, oh, I couldn't stand it. So that's that's a real bummer. Um, I've missed a lot of, I missed a lot of fun things. 
Where were we? Right, so now my biggest problems, as you can tell from the title of this video, I can't read. <laughs> um, I had this vision problem, I'd say for the last month. I think before then it was just general, like everything was so overwhelming that I didn't notice it particularly in my vision. I read like three books in the first month of being sick, um, which was then more like, do I have the energy to read rather than like the attention and linguistic visual capabilities. Okay, at the start with cognitive issues, um, I remember very specifically week one, I forgot the name of a good friend. I just couldn't think of their name. I could think of their like legal name, but not the name that we called them. And that was weird because that was just like someone who just plucked something out of my brain. Um, and a lot of people describe the like the long COVID neurological symptoms as being brain fog, um, where you're sort of just like wading through to try and make your brain work. Unless I'm in one of those moods where I can't think or speak. Uh, generally, my brain has been pretty on it. Um, the exception is that I have lost words. Words have, some words, not in my brain. <laughs> and I don't, it doesn't feel like I'm wading through a fog to get them. It's just like, well, some things have just been plucked away. And that's annoying when you come across one of those words, but generally, it's generally it's not too bad. Anyway, back to the, the vision thing. About a month ago, I'd say, I, it really started to notice this where I could only see the thing directly in the middle of my vision. And I think I was trying, I think I was trying to read a book and it was like, I can read, but I'm seeing, I see a word and then I move to the next word and my brain has no idea of what's going on around it. Like it's one thing at a time. And I didn't realize until then how much I rely on like my peripheral cognition for like making a flow of of understanding um it's really bizarre and so hard to describe where just i could o i could literally only see the thing in front of me i w and my peripheral vision is fine but i just couldn't comprehend it this was made most stark for me um a week or two ago where i was out in nature so now nowadays i'm pretty good at moving um today i'm a little bit breathless but generally i can go on dog walks and i'm happy um, and out in the green, I feel really good. Uh, but I was, <laughs> I was walking in this lovely green field and we crossed a gravel path and I looked down at the gravel and my brain went haywire. Um, it was like, I cannot comprehend large amounts of information. My brain could not take it in. Um, so that's, that's like, has been the starkest example I found where I've been like absolutely fine looking at green, look down at gravel and it's like, it's like my whole brain is vibrating. Um, it's so strange. Uh, so that's what's really difficult about reading is just the amount of information my brain is trying to take in and it cannot. Um, so I've actually been like using my phone a lot more. Like I can read Twitter. I feel like that's such a, oh, these millennials and their attention spans, I can only read tweets. And to be honest, I have a lot more sympathy for people that don't have the attention span to read um, because I feel like if people's brains are anything like what my <laughs> what I'm experiencing now I can see why it would be bloody difficult to read if your brain just struggled to take in information in that way um, anyway so I can I can sort of read Twitter I don't know whether it's like the distance from my face, the size of the writing, dark mode definitely helps because if I'm like on Twitter and then I look at an article that's on a white background with black text, pff, nope, doesn't, doesn't work. It's been one of the most disheartening symptoms because as you may be able to tell, um, I love, I love to read and I think as reading folk, we really see um, stories as solace. So not having access to that at the moment is really heartbreaking, um, really heartbreaking. I've been trying to listen to audiobooks, but m most of the kind of the novels I like to read, I don't, I don't like them as, as audiobooks. So um, yeah, it's shit. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad. I'm sure it's something that will fade away. And like today, I'm feeling particularly good visually. I can make sense of stuff. That's nice. I can read these types not the sideways I can it's just like it takes longer for my brain to process the information 
Um, but yeah, I'm also like afraid of picking up a book and then getting really frustrated and putting it down and then like not, not being able to read for even longer. So oh, I don't know what to do. I might try and get my Kindle and see if that's better. Um, cause I could like bump up the font size and, and change, change the font to one that's like really focused on, on readability, um, and see whether I can do it that way. But it's so heartbreaking because I love, I love these tree slices. I love them. Um, and I know, I know I will be able to read again. I will read again. Um, it just might not be for a while. So that's rubbish. Um, and that's also the reason why I'm unable to work. You may, I seem very sprightly today. I'm very, I'm, I'm very jovial in general, even if I can't really cross a room. Uh, but beyond like my body telling me to lie down all the time, that's the main reason I can't work at the moment. Uh, because I'm a software engineer. So I'm looking at code all day and the brain is not happy with a screen full of code. It's just not, it's just not happening. And the chronic pain bits, like how my legs just constantly hurt. Um, I think this ties back into a lot of the stuff I was saying about just being really harsh on my body and expecting expecting to be able to overcome things easily. Um, I'd always sort of assumed that people that experience chronic pain, even if you experience every day, your brain eventually just kind of like gets used to that sensation. And it has been really shocking. <laughs> to find that that is not the case. You can just be in the same pain every single day and it feels like pain every day. And I just, I, I never really had that empathy with people that experienced chronic pain before. Um, I just kind of, I just always assume that our brains can get over stuff like that, but that's not, the brain is telling you that something is wrong and it's constantly wrong. And uh, yeah, I'm learning a lot. Okay, let's move on to medical help. Who has helped me along this journey? And let me tell you, I've not received a lot of help. I know I've talked, I've said, mentioned several times I've spoken to doctors, um, but in the UK, it's not classified as long COVID until you've ex been experiencing symptoms for 12 weeks. And until then, they will do nothing for you. They will tell you to rest. They will give you sick notes. If there's something that seems really like outside of the realm of what COVID is, um, they will progress with that, but they are basically like, they can't do anything until 12 weeks. Um, which is really annoying <laughs> being like at week 10, like, I know I'm not going to be fixed in two weeks. Can we do something please? Um, but you know, there are millions of people that are suffering the same way I am. I don't blame the doctors and nurses for not having enough time. Um, they're definitely overwhelmed with this. Uh, but I is, it has been extremely frustrating for me. Um, one of the worst bits was when I um, I have private health insurance through AXA from work. Um, I no longer do. I cancelled that shit because they have a whole nice website of their long COVID program and it just says you need a referral and then they'll hook you up. Panel of COVID specialists, chat through people, physiotherapy. So I was like, I must get on this. And around week eight, I talked to one of my doctors and they were like, oh yeah, happy to write your referral for that. And then I phoned up AXA and they were like, oh, we don't have a long COVID program. And I was like, but this is, this is the website that says that you, you do. And they're like, no, you need to be referred for like a particular specialty, like a respiratory issue or a cardiovascular issue. Like we can't just write long COVID. And I was like, this is literally what your website says. Um, and you know, I, made a complaint and the feedback I got from the complaint was that they weren't at fault and nothing was wrong. And I felt so let down from that because that was like my lifeline of someone's going to help me. Someone's going to help me. <laughs> and they didn't. I just had to wait until, until I hit the 12 week mark, which I now there. Um, and things have actually been progressing now, which is great. Um, when I spoke to a doctor around 12 week work where she referred me to the NHS COVID long program, long COVID program. Um, I talked about how my main issue is this visual, visual thing. And she was like, go get an eye test. Like I, cause that's not a very common issue that we found in long COVID or that I've, she met in long COVID. Um, so I went and got an eye test and the eye test was, um, 
great. Uh, apparently, like, my prescription's perfect, my peripheral vision is perfect, which is madness, because I can only see the middle. <laughs> like, I have tunnel vision, where, like, I know that there's other stuff there. My brain is not taking it in. Um, so it was a relief, but confusing, to find out that my eyes are fine. Apart from, apart from, I've got a hemorrhage in one of my eyeballs, um, which apparently will reabsorb itself, <laughs> which is weird. Um, but yeah, she was like, this is either because you have high blood pressure or you have high blood sugar levels because this isn't a very normal thing. It's fine. It won't damage your vision, but like, it's usually because of one of those things. Um, so I've had, my blood pressure is fine. I did that the other day. So waiting on the results from blood sugar levels. Um, I also got a chest x-ray yesterday, which was fun. Um, yeah, had a lot of bloods taken. So they're referred to the long COVID, um, clinic. Um, but the main job, as far as I know, the main job, initial job of the long COVID clinic is make sure it's not something else in disguise. <laughs> make sure it's just this nebulous long COVID thing that you can struggle with indefinitely and not cancer. Um, or diabetes, or lung disease, or whatever. And I feel pretty confident that it's just good old bog standard long COVID. And when they know that, I don't think there's much you could do. What I would really like, I would love to talk to a physiotherapist about having like an exercise regime, um, because now I can move about fairly okay, but my, my baseline um, fitness is zero. So I don't know how to build that up sustainably. I don't know like how much to rest um, and all that. And I, yeah, I'm not part of any like long COVID support groups, which I think would have been really helpful during this process. Um, but it's been one of those things where like, I agree. And people that say to me, oh, you should find a long COVID support group. It's like, yeah, but where am I going to find the energy to find a long COVID support group and then actually engage in the community? You know, I don't, I don't have that. So that's where we're at now with the symptoms. Um, I want to talk a bit about work and money uh, because these are things where I have been so unbelievably lucky. Um, as I said, before November, I was working as a contractor. I did not have any emergency fund. I didn't have any like freelance insurance. Um, I did have savings, but they were like, I'm saving for a house. So I didn't, I didn't really have much to fall back on. Um, and I'm really thankful <laughs> that I got a job that has paid sick leave. Um, so I've got 12 weeks, 12 weeks of fully paid sick leave. And then I have this weird middle week where I'm on statutory sick pay, which is 95 pounds a week or thereabouts, uh, which is abysmal. That's just n nothing. Um, I mean, it's something, but it's just nowhere near enough to live on. And then after that, I can claim this income protection insurance through work, which would be 75% of my base salary, uh, which is so good. It's so good to not have to worry about money. And that's been something I've been so thankful for this whole time is that I know that my recovery would have been so much worse if beyond all of my internal pressures to return back to work, I also like needed to financially um yeah 75 percent of my base salary is uh enough for me to live on like i'm not going to be saving any money i might have to pull back on some of my spending um and i won't I'm not eligible for like bonuses and stock and all that that is part of my compensation package at my big tech job uh but generally i am so lucky um and <laughs> i'd always thought that as a young, I'm 28, as a young, fit, healthy person, that even if, like, worse did happen in any regard, like, I just make it through, I just battle through, and I can't tell you how comforting it has been to not have to worry about those things right now, um, it's made me a lot more cautious in so many aspects of my life, I'm gonna have all of the insurance after this, and I just, I really feel for the people that don't have that financial safety net um, where if you're going through this and especially when you think about it going on for years effectively, like I'm, I'm still the mindset that from the trajectory of my illness, 
I should be I should be good in the next couple months. But who knows? Who knows? And it's just nice to not have to worry about that. Um, sorry, this just kind of sounds like I'm boasting about getting free money. <laughs> it just does. It, it's like, I just feel so blessed. It's such a miracle. Because if this happened to me six months earlier, I have no idea what I would have done. I would have had to move back in with my parents. What would my boyfriend have done? What about the dog? Like, what about our house and all our stuff? I have no idea. It's terrifying to think of. Um, and I just, yeah, I urge you if you are if you are a uh, uh, a freelancer to have an emergency fund and it not just be like, oh, I'll just take some money for my savings. Like if you have three months of like cash on hand, I know it's brutal to build up, um, but wow, the, the, the stress you'd feel about being um, in a financially precarious position when you got sick is so much worse than like setting back your plans to, you know, get married or buy a house or whatever by a year or two. Um, please have an emergency fund. <laughs> Be cleverer than me. So that's it. I think I've probably missed a million and one things, haven't I? Um, I've missed talking about how grateful I am for my lovely boyfriend who's been taking care of our dog and feeding me for months <laughs> and will continue to, um, which is a real best blessing. I love you. I'm now starting to feel a bit self-conscious about how chipper I've been in this video. Um, that feeds back into it. Charlotte, just believe yourself. You know you are unwell. You don't have to worry about other people perceiving you as being like healthy and fraudulent. You're sick. <sighs> Sorry, needed that little pep talk there. Um, thanks for watching this video. I'll make some more videos about the book someday. You know I'd never completely abandon this channel. And if you have any questions about anything I've said, or if you would just like to vent about your experiences of being in this shitty, shitty situation, please leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, thanks for listening to me waffle. Oh, I almost forgot to get the dog, sorry. Usually he comes in at the start of the video, he's right here. Hold on, Huxley. Oh, because since I got a dog, whenever I put out a YouTube video, he would have to be at the start and at the end, and I didn't bring him at the start, and that was me. Um, this is Huxley, he is, very scruffy. He's getting a groom next week um, and then he'll be all smart. Um, but uh, I love him and he's the light of my life and he's been cuddling me so much. So maybe he's who I owe the greatest thanks to. Thank you, Huxley. Okay. Goodbye.